Good morning, all. Hope everyone had a great weekend. We tore into our school bus this weekend and uh, I found out that I have uh, muscles I didn't know about. So it gives you a kind of a pretty much idea of what we're looking at tentatively. So today we are going to talk about the air barrier and uh, there. We're going to talk about the air barrier. I posted a couple of things up there uh, that you might want to read through that are pretty cool. Talks about this stuff a little bit. Uh, basically, the uh, the book, uh, Georgia Builder's Guide, is, uh, let's see, this is, I think it's chapter four that I'm going to be going through today. Yes, chapter four air leakage. And uh, so, you know, again, we're talking about creating a continuous air barrier. And there's been different um, uh, different arguments as to whether, where, where this air barrier should be. Should it be inside, outside, so forth. So, you know, when we're talking about fixing up an old house, and I did a I did a search on Google to find the average age of a house in the United States. And it so happened to be 37, 37 years. So if it were, if we're talking about today and I don't remember when the, uh, the, uh, the, the thing was written. So we're going to say that it was, you know, the average house is built in 1984. Now that didn't, uh, it, depending on where what region you're in, let me just uh, I gotta get rid of these stupid panels. Hide floating meeting panel. Okay. Um, so average age of a house. Well, if I could spell God. The US. See if it brings, yeah, this is the one. So, uh, this was, uh, you know, it was talking about different regions. And so, uh, you know, it's the average, average age of a house, approximately 37 years old. And it uh, doesn't tell me when this was written. So, uh, but anyway, I mean, when you look it up here in the you know, New York, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania area, then you're looking at houses that are 50 to 61 years old. All right. So, you know, we're talking very old houses, uh, 1960. Now that's the average. That means that, you know, that's the middle of the road. Some are built newer, some are built older. And especially when you're talking about here, and I would say that the, one of the reasons that uh, that number gets pulled down so much here is because there is a lot of old houses there. I mean, there's some that's, and you know, and, and these regions through the through the Atlantic anyway, uh, there's houses that was built 17, 16, you know, old, very old, 1600s, 1700s, very old. And that's what pulls these numbers down. These states are the ones that have the newer houses, probably because they have uh, you know, there, there've been booms in building. Uh, so they're talking about the number of houses, uh, versus, uh, you know, the new houses that are built. So, uh, you know, when we're looking at these houses, we have to think, what are we looking at? What are we getting at? What, uh, are we trying to do? So when we're looking at this, uh, continuous air barrier in here, we have to think again, where do we put it? Well, if you've got a 61 year old house, you don't want to strip off the, the siding outside and, and put some kind of air barrier outside. You're going to put it on the inside. 
So a lot of that is done by drywall. So we do uh, our jet board. We do jet board, uh, an airtight jet board, where, meaning that we tape all joints. And uh, so it's not as easy really as you think or as simple, I, I guess you could say is what I'm trying to think of. Let me find my pen, my little drawing pen. Cats come through here and jump on my desk and I make a horrible mess. Uh, so when we're looking at, we're, well, let's say that we bought one of these houses that, you know, is older than dirt. And uh, we're going to try to, you know, fix up this house, retro fitting pretty much. So, uh, you know, there's several things that you can do. Again, you know, and if the siding is pretty good, we don't want to mess with the siding. We don't want to take that siding off. We're just going to leave it there. It's going to be okay where it's at. But what we can do is we can come in here to this drywall, jip board, a jip board, jip board. I think you call it jip board, not drywall. Drywall is a brand name like sheetrock. <coughs> so, uh, basically what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that we have a good tight uh, seam here and all of the seams that that are you know along the walls we want to make sure that those are good as well but the problem lies right here when we go to the floor so you know, in, in some of these houses, we may have carpet. Uh, we may have uh, hardwood, if we're lucky. One of the things that right after World War II was softwoods. They used, believe it or not, they used softwoods on their floors. I redone uh, my aunt's house. The house was built in 19, somewhere between the later 1940s and 1950, and the whole thing was soft wood flooring, it was yellow pine. Uh, don't, don't be uh, fooled by that name. That, that yellow pine, it, as it ages, it becomes as hard as oak. So, ugh. and then, uh, you know, if we've got carpet, then underneath it, we've probably got plywood, uh, if we're lucky. All right, so when I say if we're lucky with plywood, a lot of those houses, if we're looking down on the house, they were they took just boards and they done the subfloor in this fashion which means that these boards have shrunk and in some cases you can put your finger right through the middle of it and i want you to remember that remember this type of floor here uh you can go into your crawl space or your at uh, your uh, basement and look up at the floor and uh you know, pull back a little bit in insulation. You can figure out what kind of subfloor you got in your house. Question, why do they use diagonal back then? Well, that's a very good question. So when, you know, when we do our framing, we have our joists that run back and forth. We put the boards on there that way so that they touch more than one uh, board. Uh, this also is, uh, this goes back into bridge designs so that uh, when a cart rolled over this, then the, the wheel of the cart would set on different boards. It wouldn't be all on the same board. In other words, if we went this way, then the wheel of the cart would set on the same board. If obviously we wouldn't go this way because it would be, you know, it'd be too big of a span. So by putting out a diagonal, you uh, distribute you distribute the weight a little bit better on different boards, uh, and it just uh, you know it 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 helps with the uh, the weight distribution as well as being worn down. Uh, again, if we were to do something like this, then you know as these wheels are rolling over the same board at the same time, then these are going to get wore out. Uh, where we're doing it here, different, you know, we're going to have weight on this board and this board and not on these others. It just helps distribute the weight a little bit. And they would use the same technique for exterior sheathing and then the diagonal bracing provides racking strength for the walls too, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that goes for the same for the floor too. So, you know, if we've got the walls and, you know, without bracing of some sort, 
then these things can, you know, they can rack back and forth, but by putting the diagonal boards on there, then it, it adds strength and, and stops this racking effect. And that's, it does, you can do the same thing in a floor as well. So when did we stop doing it that way and why? Cost? Plywood. When they, when they invented plywood. So Just when we've got this looking at this house here and we've got our joists going across through there, then we, when we put in plywood, plywood obviously does not move. It doesn't rack. And uh, we have different, well, different plies. Basically, when we look at a piece of plywood, then on one layer, the grain is going to run this way. But then when we, you know, we put the next layer on top of it, then the grain is going to run in an opposite direction and, and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Generally, when you're looking at a piece of plywood and you're looking at the grain, the grain runs in the longer or eight foot section. So the grain is running in this direction. And so in most cases, you have an odd number of layers so that whatever you have on the face, you have on the back. So if, if it's going in this direction on the face, it's going to be going that direction on the back. And the more layers that it has, the stronger it's going to be. Now you can get this, you can buy plywood as little as three layers, um, but most of the time they're five uh, and up. So if you get to a, like a nine, uh, then you've got a really good strong piece of plywood, but you know, the more layers you have, you can just go ahead and add more dollar signs to it. And when we're talking about uh, finished plywood, uh, like uh, cut cabinet grade plywood, then cabinet grade plywood is uh, basically it's poplar layers. So we're going to have multiple layers in here and this is all going to be poplar. And then there's going to be a very, 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 very small, super thin veneer on the front and the back of this plywood uh, that is going to be oak or maple or, or walnut. I mean, you name it. Uh, oak is the, probably the most popular. Uh, maple comes next, I guess. And then all of your other woods uh, are going to be, uh, again, you know, each time you go to something a little bit more rare, you're going to add another dollar sign to it. Oak plywood, I think right now goes for about 50. Well, I don't know, to be honest with you, I haven't looked at it since before the pandemic. So you know, let's say last year at this time, it was probably about $50. Uh, God knows what it is now. It's probably about 120. Uh, it's ridiculous. So, uh, you know, the different types of plywood uh, is going to, and the, and the plywood, you always run the plywood with the grain doing the span. So I know that's a little bit hard to comprehend sometimes. So, uh, this is the span. So this is one joist to another. Uh, so basically what I tell my students is, you know, if we were to put our plywood on this direction, this would be wrong because the grain would, would be spanning the longer distances. So always make sure that you are trying to get as many joists as you can with your piece of plywood. Uh, so the, the grain spans, the grain goes in the direction of the span. In this case, the span is between the joists. Uh, and when you get into uh, concrete forming and stuff like that, th those laws are set in place. I mean, you know, we, we could, by law, we can put a piece of plywood in in this direction. There's nothing in the code says we don't have to put it in this direction. We certainly can. But when you get into commercial work, when you get into uh, building concrete forms, this it, this is illegal. You just can't do it. They they will call you out. That you can you actually set up these forms, and you're going to call a building inspector, and he's going to come out and look at these forms before you pour, so that they don't collapse for one thing, and that make sure that you're you're doing it correctly, just like digging a hole in the ground and coming and doing your footings. Uh, and if he sees that the plywood is running uh, 
in this direction, long ways across the joist, he's going to make you tear it down because it's it's this is where the stronger the stronger is across through there. And you know because it's plywood, it eliminates racking completely and totally. And uh, by offsetting the our joints, then we can e e actually make it even stronger. Uh, and this is generally the way the floor is is uh, subfloored today. Uh, the code says it has to be uh, glued and nailed. Glued and nailed. Again, the code is a grade D, so it's just passing. Uh, one of the companies that I work for, they say that it's glued and it's ring shank nailed. So, you know, he goes a little extra step. The code doesn't say you have to use ring shank nails. And uh, what does a, for one, for you guys that don't know what a ring shank nail is. There's a ring shank nail and it has, uh, has these little barbs on there so that it doesn't pull back out. Uh, my house was built in 66 and it used uh, just uh, plain old nails and a lot of those nails pull back out because uh, luckily we did use plywood. We had plywood in 1966 and the, this was done in, in, in that type of uh, house. My, my first house was built in 1960 and it did not have plywood. It had the diagonal boards on it. So in the course of six, and in the same town, I mean, just almost in the same neighborhood. Uh, so in the, in the course of six years, it changed over to plywood. Uh, so, you know, this is a D that's, that's basically what the code says. You can go up to a C, but really when every house that I ever built, we glued and screwed. Uh, and that, that, I guess as an A, I don't, I don't know. I mean, that's about the best that I can do that I know of, uh, unless I just go crazy and put nails and screws, but the nails, if you put screws in, nails are worthless. Uh, so remember that wood expands and contracts at all times. And today being a wet day, it's going to uh, expand. Uh, yesterday, especially in the wintertime, we generally have drier uh, and an, a drier environment in the wintertime because all moisture is frozen when the temperature is below freezing and uh, they'll shrink. Uh, so right now we're, we've got a lot of movement going on. They're trying to get bigger and they will actually push a nail out. Uh, you got your, your, you know, your plywood there and you've put that nail in there. And because of the, you know, expansion and contraction of this, then, you know, it's going to, it's going, actually going to wiggle this nail back up. You've probably seen that on decks. Uh, decks probably expand and contract more than any other, uh, other wooden frame structure in a house. And anybody that's ever walked across one of those five quarter board decks that's been nailed down. Uh, you've probably caught your toe on one of those, uh, the web of your toe on one of those nails sticking up and it's, it'll wake you up in a heartbeat. So uh, decks should all be screwed. Any, any wood that is outside should be completely and totally screwed uh, because of the expansion and contraction of the, of the wood. Okay, so we've got this house here and uh, we're going to, uh, you know, we've got to do better on our taping and jointry. Uh, any holes that might be in there from hanging a picture, they should, uh, they should be, you know, put something in it. Don't just paint over them, uh, spackle them before you paint over them. But then the, one of the main problems that we have here is where these two go together. And uh, so we have our baseboard. Hopefully we have a baseboard. If we don't, add a baseboard. Um, so because we have jip board here, 
and we have an unknown product here, probably uh, either hardwood, softwood, plywood, OSB, uh, any number of things that could be for the subfloor and then the uh, finished floor, then because these are dissimilar materials, that means that they expand and contract at different rates. So what do we do? We go right in here and we can caulk the heck out of that. If we're smart, we're going to pull this uh, baseboard up and we're going to caulk right here. If we're not so smart or we're lazy, then we're going to caulk at this point and this point, and then we can just go back and put a piece of cord around or shoe mold or something over top of that and hide it, and definitely make sure that you're using some sort of paintable uh, caulk so that you can paint right over top of that. Silicon, <coughs> most silicon products will not take paint. Um, I, I, it just, it doesn't stick to it. So I use Alex Plus which is a paintable uh, latex uh, sealant that does a really good job inside and out. Just make sure you don't put it on a, a day like today because it, it is water soluble and, and if water gets to it before it dries, it's gonna run, it's gonna wash away. So uh, latex is probably your, your, your best, oh for God's sakes. Latex is probably your best uh, use for caulk and for your paint. So you can actually use this latex paint also as an air barrier in here. Latex, you know, if you're painting everything all the way to this point here, and hopefully you've got some caulk here, then you're going to do the best job that you can by just painting all of this um, with a latex paint and it's gonna look really nice. Make sure that you use at least two, if not three coats of paint uh, when you're doing this. Of course, one coat looks like crap anyway. Some people uh, will, will do a uh, base coat and by doing a base coat, you can basically use a cheaper type paint to seal everything, seal the, uh, seal the joints, uh, seal the, the uh, jet board and uh, it, you know, it's not as expensive as your, the paint that ha you've had uh, tinted by any means. So let's go back and, and talk about why we want to do this a little bit. So again, here's that continuous air barrier in here. And here is some of our problems that we have. We have all of these air leaks that, that happen in here. And the reasons behind these Actually, let me let me tell you this little story first. This is a, a pretty sad story, but it's it's you know it's pretty cool at the same time. So there was a house down in Greensboro that uh, one of the children happened to wake up and complained about not being able to breathe and not be and and their eyes burning. And they went and woke up their parents. Thank God. And. It, I don't know if you remember or not, a couple of years ago, there was a motel room, one specific motel room in a hotel in Boone. Uh, first, an elderly couple died in it due to uh, uh, asphyxiation. And then, dang it, a couple of months later, and I might have them reversed, uh, maybe a year later, uh, another person died in the same room uh, from the same thing, from asphyxiation. So, it is super important to make sure that we have proper venting in a house, especially when we have gas involved. So this is a house that was in Greensboro. Bedrooms, bathrooms are all in circulate the house. We have the main room, the kitchen here. And then we had this little utility room in the center of it with, and these are all gas, gas dryer, gas uh, water heater, domestic hot water heater, uh, and um, an HVAC. We've got a louvered door in here because of the ways that these vent. Let me explain that. Once you understand the, the way they're vented, then you'll understand how they work. 
All right, so this is the typical uh, vent on a water heater. Notice that it has, uh, you know, it has an airspace in here. What's up with that? Well, that helps drive the air out. It, it causes uh, a, a draft in here for air to pull up through here and helps get rid of the gas that's in here. And a lot of those, uh, you know, a lot of those are, are like that. So that's, that's that vent, there's an opening there. So once you know that, then most of these are the same way. Sorry, my, my car's extended warranty people are trying to get a hold of me. So um, everybody went to bed and all the doors are closed. Okay, so all the doors are open, all the doors are closed. Remember that this is this is louvered here. All the bedroom doors are closed. And I would dare say it probably had shag carpet in it, some sort of deep carpet in it. So what happens? Uh, the HVAC comes on with all the doors and, and, and uh, closed in there then we end up with different, different uh, pressures in here. All right, so an imbalance in pressures uh, because there's, you know, the air conditionings are running and these two rooms and these two bedrooms, uh, the doors are closed, there's no air leaving, then these become very positive. And this becomes very negative because we're taking air back through this return and pushing it into the bedrooms. This room becomes doubly negative because A, we're taking air out of this and pushing it into these rooms. And we remember we've got these open vents here that are trying to get this gas out. So the CO2, basically because it's a double negative in here, the CO gas gets sucked back down and into this room. It goes out through this louver door, travels around here to the return, the return sucks it in and takes it to the bedrooms. So things had to change. Otherwise, we're going to end up dead. First of all, we seal the duct work around here. This You're going to hear me say this multiple times in here. Sealing, 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 sealing. Sealing the duct work. Adding a fresh air duct in that room, basically turning that room into an exterior room uh, or an exterior condition, unconditioned space, and then taking away that uh, that vent, sealing the door, preventing all of that from ever happening again. And then we want to get through some sort of transfer grills. Number one, get rid of that shag carpet because it's holding a whole bunch of toxic crap in it and viruses and everything else. And then you can create different types of ways for air to move from room to room. Uh, so let's let's talk about that. How can I how can I make here so I can get the and remember guys if you got something to say on the chat you'll have to holler at me. Sam, uh, do you go ahead and tell us about that? Uh, do you remember exactly what happened with that hotel? Uh, I'm pretty sure it was CO2. Like, is it still in business? Uh, I think so. I mean, it's uh, it is, yeah. It's, it's that there. hotel right across the street. It's on 421, right across the street from uh, the that Jeep place that redoes yeah. re the uh, Jeeps. Mm -hmm. It That's is. Still in business, but, uh, you know. The state come in there and had a had a uh, you know they made them go through the entire building. So yeah, do you remember that? That was pretty bad. It was. Uh, let's see. All right, so uh, we have. Uh, we can do that. You can do a louver in door, okay? Obviously, you can do a louver in door, or you can do what's known as a transom window. So you got your door, and then in the you know it, back in the twenties, thirties, uh, nineteen or eighteen hundreds, they had a window up here at the top 
that would open and it was called a transom window and allowed air to move back and forth between the rooms, obviously because we didn't have fans and air conditions and all that good stuff. We basically relied on passive air movement throughout the house. So uh, to give you an idea of what these look like, So this is this these are you know the new ones. This uh, probably newer, but this I don't know what how what age this house is. But this is how they look. This is what they done. They just opened up. Uh, doors could still be shut. You don't have to uh, worry about you know people peeking in unless you know somebody's coming down the stairway and and uh, it allowed air to move from room to room to room. Uh, so what about a transfer? Let's see, let's call it, I know I'll not get, not get it right, transfer, air transfer grill. There we go, air transfer grill. So you can get these grills uh, that go right in the wall and allow air to move back and forth. Uh, and, but it's, you know, you're gonna have a little bit of movement of sound through there. You can also do them above the door as well. But then this is probably my favorite method here is you've got an empty walls cavity in there. And by doing it this way, then you actually are going to be passively moving some air uh, through here. And uh, you've got a little bit more sound control. OK, so, the re you know, obviously, if you've got a house full of kids, you did something to get those house full of kids and you might still want to be doing it and you don't want the kids to hear you doing it. So, you know, you want to try to prevent that a little bit, kind of deaden that sound a little bit uh, and, uh, and and do this type of transfer grill on there. Would you enlarge that image, please? Eric, uh, I've put in a couple of these before and I've run into different folks who feel that that might be part of the HVAC system and that then that entire wall cavity needs to be sealed, mastic sealed like a return because that's then a, a supply, uh, it's transferring conditioned air. I don't know how you feel about that. I didn't think that that was quite the, the same. Yeah, I'm kind of like you, uh, you know, if it, let's say for instance that we, uh, if I were to, uh, whoop, that's not what I wanted. And I've had to do this in some basement renovations. You know, if I had the HVAC plugged into this and using this as a conditioned airspace to, you know, to save for room and space, I, I, I would agree with that. But, you know, passively, I don't know, uh, I just don't know about that, you know. And I guess it would, you know, it'd probably be up to the build inspector, but uh, I mean, it would be the, you know, it would be again going the extra mile. But if we're talking about a, a retro, then, you know, cutting here, cutting here, uh, putting these louvers in without having to mess with the rest of the wall. I mean, yeah, you're going to have some dirt probably get, you know, pushed through there. And hey, I mean, you know, who's to say you can't, uh, you know, once you cut these holes in here, take you a leaf blower or something and stick in one of those holes and blow it out, you know, get all that crap and stuff out of there. Uh, and then it would be a little bit better. I mean, I just I've I pulled, want to be worth pointing out since, you know, the way that some people can read the code is that you're not allowed to use any aspect of the building assembly as part of the duct work, right? You can't just stick a return into a wall cavity and use the entire stuff yes. bay as a return. Right. Um, and they, they saw it kind of like that. I just wanted to point out that that could be a concern and an issue if you're trying mm -hmm. to do this technique. I would guess that it would be, you know, up to the local building inspector, you know, how he it could be a fire hazard. Do what? It could be a fire hazard because, you know, ductwork's metal, it's protected. That's just raw wood. It could get yeah, overheated. Or... We're not putting, we're not connecting to the HVAC here. We're just letting passive air flow through here. 
okay. again, if uh, you know, if we had if we had an air conditioner, if we had a system hooked up to this, I could I could argue with you there. Uh, but this is just pat. This is to prevent. Well, let me ask you this. OK, so we got a door here. And the door is closed. What is the recommended airspace between the bottom of the door and the floor? The finished floor, whether it be carpet, hardwood. What, what, what do you guys think? Half inch. Anybody else? Anybody else? What? An inch. An inch. But if you wanted to equalize the pressure <laughs> when the door's inch. shut, you're going to have to cut out about a foot at the bottom of the door. <laughs> well, I agree with you there because it's always going to be a positive space. That right there <laughs> is the recommended one inch. Now, <clears throat> I can remember my neighbor. He was uh, he was a little hornball growing up. And uh, when his brother had his girlfriend come over to the house and they might've been doing the, the funky monkey in the bedroom, he was down here eyeballing them boogers in there because of that one inch. All right, so, but one inch is the recommended uh, room for a door. Now, look around in your house, do you have an inch? If you live in a, in a, a manufactured home You've probably got that one inch, maybe a little bit more. I've noticed that they're really huge. Uh, but if you're, I'm sorry. I was just going to say trailers do it. I worked at Oakwood Mobile Homes and I know they released an inch. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but most, you know, stick built homes don't have this inch. You got shag carpet in there. <clears throat> that inch because you've got, you know, when you <clears throat> mute yourself there, Tim. Uh, oh, you know, when, sorry. When, doors open and you're just you know you're wearing the carpet down in there between it and uh you know it, it you're not going to have that one inch but you know by by when the air conditioner turns on the bedroom is going to be a positive if the door is shut regardless but with that one inch hopefully you know we can reduce some of this down as much as we possibly can so that it's you know we still got some air movement through here Other ways you can do it is have a jumper duct. And in my house, this is exactly what we have. Um, a jumper duct. Let me just pull up my house right quick. So I renovated my house and one of the things that we had in the basement. So what you see here in white is the original house. And we had a seven foot high ceiling in our, in our basement. So we had to do a couple of things in order to get air here without sacrificing even more headroom. So we could go in here and, uh, you know, we could, uh, hang on just a second, I'm trying to fight with this stupid panel again. Uh, hide panel, there. You see this big panel in here on, in the picture? That's, that's what I have to fight with all the time. So we've got a bedroom over here, Matthew's bedroom and Eli's bedroom over here. We have a mini split right here. Uh, if you don't know what a mini split is, it's a it's a smaller type air conditioner. The outside unit sets out here and it just has uh, coolant tubes, <coughs> gas tubes that <coughs> connect the outside unit with the inside unit. <coughs> You're pulling air in and pushing out air at this point. In a conventional system, uh, you've got all these duct works going around all over the place. But so here we have a central uh, system here, air conditioning and heat. 
And then we have a wood stove here. So with Eli's bedroom door shut, there was no way of getting any air at all in here. And we've got to have some air movement in here. So what I've done was I had a drop ceiling in this section. This is a this is a new section, and I actually raised the floor uh, another uh, six eight inches rather, and I was able to do a drop ceiling in here. So right here, I have a vent in the ceiling, and then it goes into Eli's bedroom. So this is a jumper vent that runs from one to the other. So it takes air in here and pushes it out into Eli's bedroom and makes Eli's bedroom positive. All right. So I've got that inch space under here. So I do have some air flowing through here and I do have some air exchanges in here. <coughs> there is, this is not passive. There's a fan, there's an inline duct fan uh, in here and in the summertime, it comes on every 30 minutes and, run, and and shuts off for every 30 minutes. In the wintertime, it runs constant just to pull heat in here because it's, you know, this is the basement. Most of it's underground. It's kind of gloomy. So we want to try to get enough heat in here uh, to keep him comfortable. Now, in Matthew's bedroom, it was a little different story because I couldn't go up and over anything because we've got, I'm serious, I mean, we've got seven foot ceilings. Uh, poor old Eli is six foot five. There is a ceiling fan right here. And there's actually a ceiling fan in his bedroom. Bless his heart, every day he wakes up and, you know, the ceiling fan cracks him in the head and wakes him up. So we've got a ceiling fan here just to keep our air flowing through here. We don't want any cold spaces. We don't need warm spaces, no stale corners. So we keep these fans. Actually, there's a fan running here too. Uh, all of these fans are running 24-7, 365. Same with the upstairs. They're on low just to keep air movement through here. So in Matthew's bedroom, there's a bed. There's a trundle bed here underneath the steps. So this is open here. And what we've done is we took and put a vent in on this wall and with uh, a cabinet, I mean, with a, uh, a duck, uh, insulated duck, by the way, it runs over to his bedroom and behind the pantry, behind the refrigerator, behind the water heater and into his bedroom here. So we're pulling heat in this way through him. Again, there's a one inch space at the bottom of this door so that we have air being pushed out here and we're turning this room into a positive space. So this is a negative space. This space over here is huge. All of this is open all the way around through here is open. And uh, so we don't, we're not gonna feel those effects of positive and negative. We're talking probably less than one Pascal of air movement through there. But again, this has an inline fan in it that comes on, uh, in the summertime, uh, 30 minutes on, 30 minutes off. In the wintertime, constant. And we get lots of movement through here. Uh, normally, I, you know, the boys don't really uh, complain that much. In the summertime, Matthew's bedroom gets a little warm because this is directly facing south. So this room, this door, this window here lets in heat. And uh, I've told him to put some curtains or something up. He, he won't do it. <coughs> so uh, his bedroom gets a little warm in uh, the summertime. And Eli's bedroom gets a little cooler than normal in the wintertime. Again, this is the north side. This is uh, also facing west. And so the only sun that he gets in is when it's almost getting ready to set. So uh this is generally a colder room. This is generally a warmer room, but it, it works. It really does. And if you'll notice this bathroom, you know, is completely closed off here. There's no movement in here. Yes, there is. There's a ceiling fan in here. So uh, when, when this is on, uh, you know, we're going to get air pulled into it because we're putting this into a super negative space and because all of the rooms around this room, with the exception of this one little corner here, 
this is uh, this is basically a garage. It's too small for a car. Uh, it used to be this this wall here was not there, and you could park a whole car in here, but you can't now. So we put motorcycles in there, and that's why it's called the motorcycle room. Uh, but this room here is heated uh, basically from the rest of these rooms because we just you know we get air movement all the way around it, and this probably is one of the most comfortable rooms in the entire house outside of you know, this center section here. So that's how we, you know, that's one way of transferring air uh, from one room to another. Uh, and, and like I say, that's called jumper vents or jumper ducts. Stuff like that can be really important for reducing the overall air infiltration on the house. The more you've got a balanced HVAC system, the less you're forcing your conditioned air out or pulling unconditioned air in. Yes, yes. Uh, so in my upstairs, there is a ceiling fan in every room. This is going to slow me down, I know. Oh, actually, no, I already had it open. So there's a ceiling fan in every room. I hate working with blocks sometimes. They just want to, it just makes the whole drawing just not work. And again, these better be on uh, all the time. Just to keep air flowing through the house. Well, I take it back. The one in my office here is not, it doesn't run all the time. Because there's, I've only got one vent in here, which I had to steal from the vent over here. So in other words, this room here has two vents, ceiling vents, one here and one here. And I basically cut into this one when we closed in this office, because this used to be a screen porch. And I made a vent here <coughs> so that I get air flowing through here. But now remember, this is a, uh, this is an exterior door. And it's sealed. So uh, the only way that I can get air movement through here is to open a door. Uh, I'm not going to change this door out only because it's one of the reasons why it's so nice and peaceful and quiet in here right now, uh, because I've got that door shut. And uh, you ought to show us a virtual tour of your house. Uh, I will at some point. I think... Uh, I think I've got a video out there and I'll, I can post on it and uh, I'll show you my house. So uh, again, what you're looking at here is what was existing and what we've added on. So we've taken a, uh, basically we've taken a 1300 or yeah, 1300 square foot house, two bedroom, one bath house into a 4,000 square foot house with uh, two kitchens, three bathrooms, and five bedrooms. So it's, you know, but we got seven people living in here. So, uh, and, and I'm proud to say that so far my heating bill has not been over $220. I know some of you may have a heart attack with that, but we're talking about seven people in this house. And uh, the biggest thing in this house is right there. Uh, I've still got to get, I've still got to finish up my solar water heater and but seven people taking a shower and most of these yahoos want to take a shower every freaking day my wife takes two uh so and one of my sons he takes a freaking two hour shower uh so that's the main reason that i want to get this solar water uh heater put in but that's it it's you know it's a comfortable house we've put a lot of work into it uh but we've one of the things that we made sure to do is to get air flowing through the entire house. Uh, I worked with uh, an energy consultant HVAC guy, a uh, very good friend of mine. Uh, I'm gonna unplug that because it keeps popping on and off uh, so that, uh, that I could make sure that I put all of my vents and everything in the proper places. One of the things that I kind of regretted doing was uh, we ended up putting a vent here. <coughs> At the time when we were doing this, 
this curved block wall was not going to be put in place. We were, we were just going to leave this open and we were actually going to have a corner tub here. But after the HVAC was done and before we finished, we decided we didn't want the tub. Nobody would ever use it. If anybody breaks a leg or anything, then you can use the tub over in the, in the uh, community bathroom. We just wanted, you know, a nice, good, and this is our therapy shower. It has double uh, shower heads so that my wife and I can take showers at the same time. Uh, no, it's not a sexual thing. It is a, this is where we go to, uh, to, uh, to air our views, you could say. Before that, we were, we were taking showers still together in this bathroom here, and whoever, uh, whoever was the listener got the hot water. So it, the, you know, we, this is where we have our discussions. We don't fight. We, we don't fight at all. We, we do have disagreements, and this is where we go to talk about them. And uh, so he who wants to talk gets cold air until the hot water runs out. And then the speaker becomes the person getting the cold water. Let me tell you, those those uh, uh, disagreements are not as important when you're being showered with cold water, I promise you. So, uh, you know, basically you don't get out of the shower until your problem is solved and all uh, there's no hiding, you're, you're naked, you got nothing to hide behind. You have to be honest, 100% honest. Uh, and once it's all said and done, all those worries and problems are washed down the drain and you never bring them back up. And we have been happily together going on our 14th year, both of us coming from a previous marriage that didn't work out. And the biggest thing was lack of communication or the lack of honest communication, let's say that. So uh, this works for us. Uh, so, you know, because of this uh, air vent that's over here. We don't have a whole lot of air movement over here and we have to stay on this shower. Uh, otherwise mold and mildew are going to, uh, you know, they're going to build up fairly quickly. I've thought about going in back in the attic and splitting this one or actually even moving it over here. Uh, still, uh, when I go in there and look at the, the ceiling. So here is here is the that uh, that window. This window right here is that window right there. And my uh, basically, let's see. That's six eight. Uh, well, let's see. Six eight. That would be one foot four. So basically, I'm looking at. There's the ceiling right there, the top of the ceiling. You see how much space I got right there? Basically one foot, one inch to get in that attic at that portion to move that over. Uh, I, I can promise you that my belly, from my back to my belly is probably one foot two. <laughs> So, you know, every time I think about it, I think, yeah, I ain't getting up in that day I'm at it. So anyway, that, that goes to that story. Did you say you didn't have an exhaust fan in there? How'd you get around that? No, no, no. I got an exhaust fan. I'm just saying I don't have, I don't have this. This is an air conditioning supply vent. I don't have an air conditioning supply vent over here in the shower because this is all cut off now. This is all cut off from this vent. And I don't have air flowing around it unless I pop this window open. Yes, we have a vent. Um, Where is it? It's over the toilet. I'm going to try to draw a picture, but I can't find it. What's it called? Uh, fan. It is right there. Actually, no, it is right here. So I get air coming in and either it gets pushed back through the door or it gets sucked straight into the van and I don't have any air movement here. That's the only dead spot I got in the entire house is right there. And that's basically cause we end up building this uh, block wall uh, afterwards. And when I say block wall, it's a glass block wall. Question, how much of that bathroom is tile? All of it. Okay. Well, 
not all of it, not all the walls. You know, just a second, let me try something. How do I mute this? You're muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Ye yes. <clears throat> Make sure all my underwear is hidden. Okay, so this is the bathroom. Whoop, wait a minute, let me change the view. Well, how do I, there it is. Okay, so Everything is pretty much tile except for the, these walls. All right, so I've got the uh, the the uh, jet board. There is the um, the air vent in there. There's our family tree. Notice everybody's holding their nose in the bathroom. <laughs> uh, so this is where that that sink. I mean that uh, garden tub was going to go, and then here is that wall that I'm telling you about. So there's that vent. And then there's that uh, glass block wall that goes <clears throat> into the, into the, into the shower. Here, What's that? Uh, Tim was mute, uh, unmuted and he was coughing. It showed up on here. Oh, so, you know, we've got tile up to this point. And then the rest of it is is jipboard. <clears throat> so we got a, a vent, an air vent going out, the supply vent coming in, and nothing getting into this point here. Where's the exhaust fan? I don't see it. That's the exhaust fan. It's a light and an exhaust. Oh, it's combo. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're still muted. You're still muted, Eric. And he might not be able to hear you. I think he's switching back to the computer. You're still muted, Eric. Sorry about that, guys. I'm just talking up a storm here. <laughs> um, can you hear me now? What? Can you hear me now? I can't see nobody. We can, yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear me? 
Okay. All right. Cool. Okay. I'll just leave this stupid screen open and get around it. What you guys, I'm just talking up a storm. Okay. So when you're taking a shower, you should always have your vent on while you're taking a shower and it should run at least 30 minutes after you've completed your shower. So this really should be on a timer so that it goes off after you've left the bathroom. Uh, you want to get rid of this moisture in this bathroom big time. Okay, so where do all these leaks come into play? Uh, so there's a big myth right there. Never build a house too tight. All right. I've heard uh, the old timers talk about uh, the house needs to breathe. No, your house doesn't need to breathe. Let's go back and think about uh, houses that were built in the old days. And, you know, that you'll, if you, hopefully you guys have already looked at, uh, the uh, house's uh, history. So, you know, these old houses, when they were built, they didn't think about air leakage. They didn't think about any of that stuff and didn't have to, um, just didn't know, you know, what was the old saying? Uh, there was a, there was a, um, an Eskimo who went to the, uh, who went to the priest and he said, uh, so what about all these people that don't know God and Christ and all of that? I mean, are they going to go to hell because they don't know him? And, he, and the priest looks at him and says, no, you're not, you're not going to go to hell if they don't know. And then the Eskimo looks at him and says, well, why'd you tell me? So, you know, the old saying is, I asked my, my father one time, I said, how did you grow up with that air conditioning? He's like, I didn't know what the hell air conditioning was. So, uh, you know, old houses, well, maybe not that old or not, not quite that bad. Old houses, they did breathe. Absolutely. And let's talk about some of those ways that air moves through a house. So we've got three ways that they move through the house. We have mechanical means, which we just talked about, HVAC, uh, exhaust fans. We have windblown uh, air leakages, and we have something called stack effect. What is stack effect? Stack effect is where we had that, uh, there's one particular picture I'm looking for in here that just, it, I mean, it's just, Pictures worth a thousand words, and I thought there it is. So this picture here is worth a thousand words, and it is the stacked effect. Stacked effect means that remember what we were talking about: the air movement, uh, cold air sinks to the ground because of gravity, and hot air is being pushed upward, and that's what's happening here. We have cold air uh, that is, you know, going towards the ground because it's heavier than air. I mean, it's heavier than warm air. And then, uh, you know, it's starting to uh, move some of this upward until it gets warmer and warmer and warmer. And we have the hot air trying to escape. So you can see here how the, uh, you know, it, this cold air is being pushed in here at the bottom and pushing that plastic in. Somewhere around the middle here, we have wrinkles and, you know, it's, it's probably not, there's no force on it here. It's, it, it's uh, buoyant. That's what I'm trying to think of. And then when you get up here, you'll notice it's the other way. 
And this is due to the natural effects of cold air and warm air. Now, if you get into a, a, in an environment where you don't have gravity, you don't have to worry about this. But I don't know of any of you guys that might be in that uh, particular place where you don't have gravity. Uh, Eric, or at least in your house. Anyway. Also so let's take a look at our house. Now let's take a look. Okay, so let's go back to that house that had that 45 degree angle boards on it. And you remember I told you that these things shrunk. And in some cases, they shrunk more than others. You know, you put in, let's say we put in a piece of wood here from the uh, from the, the supply house. This has been sitting in a shed uh, covered, but not in a conditioned air space. So it probably has the best that we can get it down to is 19. So this wood is going to have a 19% moisture content in it. All right, that's 19 is absolutely the best that we can get without a kiln. Kiln dried wood is brought down to about a four and then it rises back. Uh, and the only time that you really get into kiln dried wood is when you're talking about furniture, uh, cabinetry, stuff like that, that is, you know, that is, you definitely don't want it to be moved. Fine, fine stuff. Okay, fine furniture, fine cabinetry. So, uh, a green wood, and when I say green wood, I'm talking about freshly cut, it's 100% moisture content. This is, uh, is going to be freshly cut, and it is your pressure-treated wood. All pressure-treated wood is put back at 100% and then sold. Sometimes you can buy it that is re-kilned. Uh, so it's, it starts with a kiln, <coughs> then it is pressure treated, and then it's kilned again. This is super rare and super expensive. All right. Most of the time, it stops right there and goes to the supply house. And when you pick it up, it's 100% you go to drive a nail in that thing, water just gonna come squishing out at you. You know what it's like. So, and, and number one thing, never put pressure treated inside the house, ever, uh, if you can help it. Now, you know, when it's on concrete, you gotta put, you gotta put that sole plate on concrete. Anytime where con uh, wood touches concrete, you've gotta go pressure treated, but definitely you wanna seal that up uh, so that no toxins come into your house. Of course, the, the pressure treated wood today is a lot better than it used to be. Uh, you know, we had kids dropping down dead because they were gnawing on the swing set at, at school. Uh, so yeah, don't, don't do that. It had all kinds of arsenic, strychnine, and all kinds of nice, nasty chemicals in it. So in, let's say right after World War II, right after World War II, we got a huge housing boom because all the guys were coming back and they were much older now and they, you know, they had them a, a girlfriend or a wife and they needed a house quick. So a lot of times those pieces of wood that were put in for the subfloor were green, meaning that they were cut down last week. So when, with that said, what happens is these boards shrink immensely, all right, hugely. And what you end up with is nice big gaps in there. There's the warranty people calling me again. <coughs> All right. So we have, damn it, go away. We've got our house. And we'll say that this is uh, built right after World War II. Okay. So war ended in 1945. And uh, from 1945 to probably about 51, 2 ish. Uh, we had a huge housing boom. And by then, we were starting to do crawl spaces. We had footings, crawl spaces. 
we used this type of, of uh, subflooring and we may have used soft wood uh, floors in our, for our finished floor. How much insulation did we put in the house? Probably none. So now we have a house. We've bought this house and we need to, re we need to renovate it to make it a healthier uh, environment for us. Now, how airish is this? Airish is an Appalachian word, by the way, meaning that it is uh, leaky as crap. So we're going to put into play three different methods of air leakage. Number one being stack effect. So by code, we have been told that we have to put air vents down here to keep our crawl space dry. Here in Western North Carolina, it gets to, you know, approximately in the 90s, uh, in the daytime, in the summertime. And if we're, if we're lucky, hopefully it gets down into the 80s at night. So, you know, we've got a lot of high temperatures here. And what's the most, what is the relative humidity in Western North Carolina? Well, most of the time, let's see right now outside, it, it is sitting, it's raining. It's 86% here at my house. All right, it's raining. But I promise you in the summertime, uh, the, the relative humidity probably never, ever gets below 40% in the summertime. Never. I've never seen it. You know how they have all the fires out west? 17% relative humidity. That's how. That's why they got so many fires out west. 17% relative humidity. Uh, and in Western North Carolina, we never, almost never see this. As a matter of fact, the last time it was 17 or below relative humidity, was 1985 in Western North Carolina. I know because the entire Western North Carolina tried to burn down. I was a firefighter at the time. So we're always talking about high humidity. All right, so let's think about this high humidity air getting sucked directly down into here. First thing it does is it cools down okay we've got a we've got 50 plus or minus degrees down here all the time and so it, it just sucks the heat clean out of all that air and when we get the presence of rapidly cold air which we're going to talk about on wednesday then some of that moisture cannot be held in that air and it gets stuck to everything. It clings to every piece of anything that it can get its little grubby hands on. And because this is dark, because this is cooler and we have plenty of moisture in here, we have mold and mildew that grows like kudzu down here. Now, We've got our old, I'll put this, this subfloor in. We put it in as green because we was in a hurry. And because we've got cold air pushing in here, this air here, or the, we, because we've got this air coming in here and it's cooler than the air up here being held, you know, being pushed down to the to earth, then we're going to have the, the, you know, this air is going to be, be pushed upward. And the further we get, it's going to, you know, the warmer air gets further and further up. And then we get this stacked effect. Now, I thought cool air fell, not rose. Junior was a little bitty baby. And we put him down on the floor and he crawled all over that floor. And he's breathing in all this crap that comes through here. Old Junior's sick about half the time. Got RSV, have to take him to the hospital. They airlift him to um, Asheville, to the Children's Hospital they got up there. 
he stays in, in a in a damn near an incubator for a week. That was my son Andrew, and the the problem was carpet. At three weeks old, my son Andrew, you know, we put him in the floor, like you need, you know, put, sometimes put him on a blanket, you know, whatever. Three weeks old, he ended up with RSV because of carpet. We had one of these houses. We were living in this house at the time. So what is carpet? Can you say filter? Because that's what it is. It's nothing more than a filter right here grabbing all the crap that's down here in the crawl space. And then when the child or you or the dog runs across this, then they, they you know, break it up and they, it flows through the house. And we had one of those uh, whole house heat, uh, whole house air conditioner fan, not air conditioner, but fan things, you know what I'm talking about, an attic fan, turn it on, open the windows, wind came in like a son of a gun, went up through here and we kept the whole house relatively cool. Well, we were also pulling that crap up through the crawl space and into that carpet filter. So we ripped all of that crap out of the house very quickly once we found out what was going on. Okay, so as we're, you know, as all of this is happening, if we've got any leaks anywhere, that air is going to be coming in as well. And that is the stack effect. So we're wanting to renovate this house. And remember I had that, uh, you know, I had that whole house fan in here. And when I turned that on, then it was pulling air out. And because it was pulling air out, if I didn't open the windows, then I'm super negative through here. And then, you know, I'm gonna have all kinds of air coming through here. Well, that's all, you know, it's supposed to be made to, uh, so that you can uh, open the windows and let all this stuff in. Hopefully you don't turn this thing on. But what about if this is just a bathroom fan? Remember I told you that bathroom fan needs to be on while we're taking a shower and 30 minutes after the shower. Well, in the wintertime, like today, I'm not gonna open a window because it's gonna be cold. So I'm gonna turn this fan on, this becomes a negative state. And then all of these other little places come into play uh, around my baseboard, uh, around the can light, you know, it's going to try to replace itself. It's thermodynamics. So we get the mechanical movement through here. All right. So this is another way that we get air movement through here. And, you know, when I moved into this house, it had those old crank out aluminum windows. So the old crank out aluminum windows pretty much look kind of like this. And, you know, this would crank out and it sat on top of another one. You just had two. And they would open up. Well, when these two go together right there, there's no seal. Absolutely none. Because they're aluminum, the transference of heat was, you know, astronomical. astronomical. I'll get it out in a minute. Aluminum is a conductor. So these were the crappiest windows that you could ever imagine. They were single pane leaky as crap, and then we have nature doing the wind blow here. You got old man winter, and you'll know in Western North Carolina, the wind blows like the son of a gun in the wintertime, and it doesn't blow at all in the summertime when we're dying from the heat. As a matter of fact, it's raining today. It's supposed to be really warm tomorrow. I would dare say the wind's probably going to pick up Wednesday, Thursday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday. The wind is going to pick up. So with that in mind, and let me just erase this house, start a new house. We get some more air movement in here, but sometimes it's not always in the same fashion. So we've got our house here and we've got positive airflow movements on this side. So that means that the curtains that were hanging in front of the window here are going to move. But then 
as the air is going across it and around it, then we get these negative spaces over here. Now, let's look at an airplane wing. Airplane wings have, uh, you know, a little bit of a, 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 a kind of a flat, almost a, a concave surface on the bottom, and then they got a convex surface on the top so that when wind goes through there, the air compresses here and we get voids down here that actually give it lift. Okay, so this is the positive side of the airplane and you'd think, well, wait a minute, it's pushing down. But then over here, we've got the negative side of it, but it pushes up instead of down. How does that work? All we're doing is moving air over here. Over here, it's hitting something and you've got a higher PSI. But over here, we have a negative PSI, which we're only moving wind. And because of this phenomenon, this side actually is stronger than the positive side. That's why, you know, when you, you get these heavy winds, the roof flies off uh, because this air going across through there is creating the same airplane wing effect and it picks up on the roof. Over here, we can actually have siding come flying off on sides where the uh, the wind was on the downwind side. So this can be very strong. So over here, all this time between stacked effect and mechanical means, we've been talking about positive air entering the house. Now when the wind blows, now we can possibly have stronger effects of air being pulled out of our house as well. So, you know, we've got a fire, uh, or not a fire, we've got a heater going on here, and uh, all of a sudden we're losing all of this because it's pulling out on this side. Maybe this side is, you know, because we thought, hey, on the, the northwest side, so here we've got our house. Most of the time, Western North Carolina, our coldest winds are coming from the northwest. You know, when they have that, uh, what is it they call it, the Arctic blast, that's where it's coming from. It's coming from uh, the Michigan, uh, Minneapolis, Wisconsin area down towards us. And this, you know, a lot of times uh, builders will fortify this side here thinking that this is going to be the windward side. But then this side is the negative side and can actually have uh, some stronger effects on it by heat loss being pulled out of the house. Wind does funky things to a house and uh, can cause all sorts of mayhem and, and problems on the house. Um, <coughs> attic hatches, we talked about that last week. Uh, to, you know, we insulate those, but what about, uh, what about adding weather stripping around those? <clears throat> Code says that we have to maintain a two inch uh, airspace between all uh, combustible flues. Uh, and that's talking about the structural members, you know, the floor joists uh, and things like that, floor joists and ceiling joists. But that doesn't mean that we can't take our drywall clean to it and then use a caulk to go around that to really close that in really good. What about any, any other type of uh, penetrations through the wall where the kitchen fan vent goes, uh, where the bathroom fan, uh, fan goes through our recessed lights? Uh, anytime we have uh, the dryer vent, oh my God, how many of you have a dryer vent that has a, uh, a door on it, a little flapper on it? And also you need to check these, uh, flappers out and make sure that they work. And to give you an example of that, uh, in our bathroom, so uh, while we were working on the house, while we were renovating the house, we had uh, we had that, that fan on, but I did not have the, this was finished. I had the drywall and everything on here, but I didn't have my soffit on it. And the vent just kind of went out and just kind of was held in place there. And inside this, 
So you've got this unit and then the, the hose attaches to it and there's a flapper here. Let me change colors. There's a flapper here. So this flapper is normally closed and then when you turn it on, the wind blows it open. Well, because I didn't have any, any type of uh, louvered vent across this thing at the time because I didn't have a uh, soffit on here. Well, a little old birdie nest got in here and he built him, or a little birdie got in here and decided he's going to build him a nest in here. So the flapper didn't, the flapper was open. It, it was stuck open. Didn't have good airflow outward, but it was open all the time. And I had, you know, presence of cold air coming in. I had the presence of uh, hot air leaving out. And so make sure that these flappers work. Um, I know a lot of times when they'll put those uh, they'll put those vents to the dryer down low, and then people hit that when they're running the weed eater, they'll tear these things all to hell and tear the flapper off. Maybe the lawnmower, maybe the dog got after it. Uh, you know, we get plants that grow up and hold this from opening or keep it open. Uh, so check those flappers out, make sure that they're working good all the time. Uh, and then, you know, just general all around leaks, leaks through holes, cracks in the, the uh, concrete, wherever a penetration of plumbing, electrical, or HVAC all together. Uh, in my house, I went up in the attic and where every wire came through into the attic, where every pipe went through into the attic, I had holes in there. Um, let me see if I can find a picture for you right quick. If I can get the stupid thing to open. Last time I tried to open one of these pictures, it wouldn't open. View. I thought there was a place where I could just select a few. Let me see right quick. Uh, let's do it this way where I can see it. I'm not just going by the names and it's not going to load, is it? Dang it. Probably not. Uh, let me try one other thing right quick. I got to plug that back in. When we were renovating our house, it was just unbelievable the amount of stuff that uh, happened or that we found in our house. That's not there, great. Never can find this picture when I want it, and it makes me, you'd think I'd saved it, and I probably have, I just can't get to it when it's, there's a picture of a mini split, by the way. Um, if you're not familiar with what a mini split, that's a mini split. This is just what we got in our basement. This is the outside unit, this is the inside unit, and all you have is the gas lines that go from, so you, you got air being pulled in from the top, and the conditioned air being pulled uh, out through the uh, front of it there. Okay, so let me just go over here, you know, again, a picture's worth a thousand words, but I can't find a stupid picture. So I took uh, the drywall down in the claw, the front closet, and I had a pull switch uh, light there. So when I took it down, here was the, the lighting box. And I'm not kidding you, not only could I put one finger here, I could put two fingers here. When I pulled the when I pulled the light fixture down, insulation just fell down through this. Okay, this is this is huge. This is huge. This is not necessary. You don't need uh, you know all kinds of holes and everything for leakages to come out through these. You know, seal it when you can. Now this is showing fire stop in a house. You do not have to use Firestop. You see the difference in price. All right, so this is just window and door si uh, uh, caulk at $4.88. It's an old picture, by the way. 
and you got fire caulk at $14.78. You don't have to fire caulk it. You have to, you have to draft stop it. This will stop drafts. All right, so the, the code is a little bit different for houses. But, you know, all of these open spaces here, and this is very common, you know, plumbers go in there and they just, they tear open what they need to get their pipe in there and they go on. It's not, you know, it's against the union rules for them to do anything else. So, you know, a piece of metal with some mastic, dang, done deal. It's going to stop the air. Uh, great stuff is probably the best thing that's ever been invented. Spray foam. I mean, holy mackerel. So you take a little bit of uh, blue board, cut it around. You don't have to put plywood on there. You know how hard it would be to cut plywood and go around this and get, you know, up and down and up and down. Blue board. Take you some blue board and get the best that you can and then fill up those spaces with uh, great stuff. I mean, geez, it's that simple. Spaces behind, uh, you know, make sure that you get all of that stuff sealed in. We talked about that the other day, you know, seal this. I mean, geez, the wind coming down through here is going to look at that. Let's look at this. Uh, well, look at the look at that hole right there where that wire goes in. How many electricians out there go back and fill in that hole with some sort of caulk or great stuff? Absolutely zero. I can promise you that right now. How many in, in insulation companies that come in to a house and fill these? Absolutely zero. They don't care. They're not going to caulk around this, which is almost impossible when you're on the outs or when you're on the inside of the house. It can be done. Uh, you know, turn the power off. Get you a can of spray foam. Stick that nozzle up there. You heard me say again, turn the power off. You don't want to spray anything wet into an electrical outlet. Uh, and fill these holes. You don't need to fill the whole box. Dear God, don't do that. Just fill that hole, top and bottom, bam, done. Caulk around there. Put you some foam uh, gaskets on there. Easily, uh, easily fixed. Um, another problem is these drop-down soffits. Uh, so the opposite of thing, you know, opposite effect can happen if you don't. You know, if you don't have these things completely sealed off, then you're going to pull air through your light, your light sockets, power sockets, any other place. Uh, remember, we talked about on the first one, caulk around those returns, close those spaces, those uh, chase spaces off, so that number one, we can continue this insulation. Uh, number two, we're not going to have air movement through here. And if you think of air as water, then you're going to have a better mentality into trying to fill some of these spaces. So cold air flows just like water. Uh, you guys have seen uh, when you put uh, ice into um, uh, dry ice, or put dry ice into water, you get uh, you get that you know that vapors you can see. Well, that's cold air. That's a you know that is a perfect example of how cold air moves and uh, you know, if you don't have these spaces filled up, then that cold air is just going to infiltrate through your house uh, all over the place. Make sure you have all uh, holes placed. And, you know, here's just a, a hundred thousand different uh, examples there. House wrap. Okay, so let's talk about house wrap for a minute. Can you use house wrap as an air barrier? Well, house wraps are designed to breathe. So when you're talking about an air barrier, uh, you're kind of thinking, well, you're trying to stop the air from movement. Really, we want to try to stop that air from moving on the outside of the, ha uh, the, outside of the walls, not the inside of the walls, uh, so that we don't have moisture being brought into the inside of the walls. And on Wednesday, we're going to talk about what happens to that moisture when it gets inside the walls. <clears throat> so house wrap is not an air barrier. You remember, um, if you'll remember correctly, last week I told you that if you do taped um, blue board, any type of uh, rigid insulation, and you tape all of the joints, uh, you don't have to use a house wrap. So if you do that method, then you have a moisture barrier and an air barrier both on the outside of the house. 
but you've got to tape everything. Notice how they show you this picture here and, you know, caulk or tape seems really good, right? And that goes with to say that the uh, zip panels, the same. Zip panels, you know, they go the extra mile and say you need to tape the tops and the bottoms too. But house wrap, for some reason, whenever you're talking about sealing house wrap, then they don't talk about the top and the bottom, but you need to uh, you need to be able to seal the top. What about the bottom? Well, here's where it gets a little fuzzy. Uh, so in, in many cases, I have heard arguments uh, over and over and over and over and over as to, well, wait a minute, if you seal the bottom of that, uh, then you're not gonna have a place for water to go. So we got our, we're going to put our house wrap on. I don't know why my undo is not working. Okay, so uh, we put our house wrap on there. And let's say that we have the presence of moisture uh, somewhere in here that, you know, got in somehow or another. And then if this is not breathable, then it's going to stop it from coming back out and this water is just going to sta stand in this wall. Or it's going to gather up and, you know, it's like on your windshield, you get mist on there and it doesn't move until it gets enough to where it runs. And then it runs down here to the bottom. And if you've got this sealed, then water can't escape through here. So the code says that you're actually supposed to make a space for water to weep out on the bottom. So again, is it an air barrier? Can't be then, can it? Uh, because we have to allow for water to, to get out of this. And then if, if water can get out, air can get in. So the house wrap cannot be used as an air barrier. And there's plenty of arguments out there on both cases. I'm not saying my way is the highway. I'm just saying it's an ongoing, constant argument to um, trying to use my mouse again to erase. Uh, it's just an ongoing argument in the energy uh, world. How the uh, can lights again are a huge problem, not only for air but for insulation, for moisture. Uh, so, you know, build you an extra little box around this and make sure you seal it. Uh, so the box is much like the, the box I was telling you about for the, the uh, disappearing stairway in your attic. Seal it to the drywall so that you don't have any air movement through here, especially these, you know, standard cans. You can see all the air holes in there, all right? So, you turn that light off, air's going to move into it. You turn it on, the heat's going to rise out of it. So, uh, you know, just make sure that you get all the holes plugged. And sometimes, you know, they make what's called a uh, backer rod, which is a foam rod, about the big, probably about as big around as my finger. And it helps so that you don't end up using a whole entire tube of caulk in a three inch gap. Uh, so, I remember when uh, when I was in lo to building log homes, we used log caulk. And this is, or log jam, uh, any of these products here. And my dad, you know, it's this is what they're made for is to, you know, seal up some of these because these wood, this wood is going to move. That matter of fact, there's a perfect example of that backer rod. Um, so you got that backer rod in there that takes up space. Uh, so, you know, you don't have to use 14 tubes of caulk to fill this up. So anyway, my dad, he picks up one of these, uh, this caulk and we were using the we were using the log builder, I believe it was, yeah. And uh, it was just amazing. He said, fills gaps up to two inches. And we just stopped. It was like two inches. That's how big this, you know, that's how big around this thing here is. It has a two-inch diameter on it. 
what do we do? Just cut the top of it and shove the whole thing in there? I mean, good God. Uh, a two inch gap is a lot. And what I'm talking about is these type joints here. Uh, you know, these actually get worse after the first heating season in a house. And if these are not done properly, it look like crap. Uh, I'm not a big fan of log on log at all. Uh, either the round type or the square type. I'm just not a big fan of it because there needs to be something there that is going to allow for movement of these two pieces of wood because these two pieces of wood do not move at the same rates. Uh, we've got, uh, and that's why they split is because they move and expand and contract all the time. And we get these little uh, fissures that run through there and Obviously, the you know you can tell right there these two don't are not even touching here, and critters can everything get in. I'm just not a big fan of log on log. Uh, so log on log is like a air barrier nightmare. You're not going to be able to <coughs> get that to work. You want to keep this stuff out. You don't want to be breathing this crap. So you know that's the number one thing. But wait a minute. If we close our house too tightly, what do we do then? Well, we have to effectively get our HVAC to work right. And then we put an ERV in. And so this is an ERV. An ERV is a mechanism that pulls in stale cold air from the inside, runs it through a heat exchanger, uh, and then this is running in the summertime, by the way. So we've got air conditioning, uh, air conditioning, cooler air on the inside and warm air on the outside. So we're pulling this cold air in and it's going through this heat exchanger. The warm air from the outside is coming in and the heat, remember heat goes to cold. Heat is gonna jump over the colder air, jump over to the colder air. And then the air that we're pulling in is going to, uh, to basically retain what coolness, coolness that it has when it was being pulled out here. Uh, an ERV, HRV, they're all pretty much the same. This is an addition to your HVAC system. So don't think that you already automatically have this. This is probably an additional $1,000 uh, upgrade on an existing air conditioning system. How many houses have it? Uh, in the United States, probably 9% have an H, uh, HRV or an ERV in their home. Uh, and, and, you know, there's no use in putting this in really if you don't fix the leaks first. If you're not, you know, if you're not stopping all of this, then there's no use of putting one of these in. But if you do all of this, then there has to be this. So uh, on Wednesday, I'm not quite finished talking about air right yet. I want to talk about the blower door test and I'm running out of time. So I'm going to stop at this point and, uh, on Wednesday, we're going to talk about blower door tests and how we test a house to make sure that we have a proper air sealing in our house. And then we're going to talk, uh, you know, when and where do we put uh, an ERV or an HRV? When is it required? When is it necessary? When do we not need it? Obviously, if we've got a World War II house that uh, is leaky as crap, we don't need no ERV in there because we've gotten fresh air in from natural causes. So. What does the acronym stand for? Any questions? For? Yeah, what does the acronym stand for? Okay. Energy. Have a great one, guys, and I will see you back here again, same bat time, same bat channel on Wednesday. Question. Can you hear yeah. me?